Thank you, and welcome everyone. Uh, welcome back. Have you ever wondered how artificial intelligence, machine learning, or uh, machine reasoning can help you handle the network complexity? I'm sure you did. So today, we are privileged to have uh, one of the people that uh, knows more about it in, uh, in Cisco. Uh, we have with us uh, Bruno Klauser, Principal Architect for Intent-Based uh, uh, Networking, who is joining from uh, uh, Switzerland. So we are moving from Ireland to uh, Switzerland for uh, this uh, third session. And uh, before I pass to uh, Bruno, remember that uh, you have a live Q&A available. So there is a Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your uh, uh, screen. And uh, we are going to move uh, to uh, Bruno. But we are going to start with a quick video and then uh, move straight to uh, uh, Bruno in uh, Switzerland. So please uh, uh, play the video. Here's the problem. Your network is getting so complex, your people can't keep up with it. But you know who can? Your network itself, using artificial intelligence. It's capable of learning continuously with machine learning capable of matching your data against a global database with complex algorithms and deep learning to spot anomalies and generate insights. Capable of using machine reasoning to apply the accumulated experience of thousands of human experts to propose solutions. But how do you activate these capabilities? It takes more than a flip of the switch. The insights and solutions of AI, ML, MR are only as good as the data the algorithms, the expertise that go into them. That's where we come in. The world's largest data platform for networking. Decades of deep engineering expertise. And the people who know your network end to end. Cisco. Artificial intelligence, uh, AI-driven networking is the topic of this next session. There's a lot of excitement at the moment around this very fast-moving topic. Um, throughout this session, um, you should get an understanding of the key concepts and also get to know about a starting point for you to realize some of its short-term benefits uh, and get ready for that uh, future as well. Welcome aboard. Let's uh, climb right in. As you are delivering these multi-experience services back to your business and your workforce, wherever they may be located, um, the key foundation of the platform that we're building is the controller-based architecture and a consistent network stack. Both Gordon and Ivan alluded to this very nicely in the previous two sessions. Now, as you are addressing the complexity and operational cost of your existing networks, it's exactly that controller-based architecture and network stack foundation that's delivering a policy and intent-based automation and also a telemetry uh, and analytics-based intelligence that you need to address uh, these complexities. Uh, there's very little doubt about that. Now, the question, however, might be if and how artificial intelligence could play a role in that. And in fact, if you're looking at CIO um, surveys run by Gartner, if you're looking at IDC digital transformation studies, if you look at our own Cisco experience and our data points from early adopters, it's pretty clear that yes, uh, that technology can play a role. But then when I talk to partners and customers and peers out there, there's still a lot of open questions and some confusion around the topic. So I'd like to address some of those as we go through the session. If you're responsible for a support organization for an IT help desk, um, the key thing you care about is, can we resolve issues faster? Can we know about issues before our customers do, or at least before our customers get impacted, before our users get impacted? If you're more on the architectural um, and engineering side of the house, you're obviously interested in medium and long-term trending and planning insights, um, facts and understanding and knowledge that allow you to act proactively and be ready for uh, whatever the new norm, the new situation may be for you. There is a fair amount of hype uh, out there around the topic as well, no doubt. So understanding what's real, what's hype is important. Understanding where to get started is important as well. And then quite frankly, there's a bit of an acronym soup. Um, so what are the basic concepts? How do they fit together? What are these acronyms actually referring to is also something I see uh, quite a bit. And of course, 
since you're here with us today, you would probably want to hear what we are doing within Cisco and what we can uh, offer you, where you can get started to leverage that kind of technology. Now, as you are evolving your operations to a more data-driven uh, operations, what's pretty clear is that incoming facts, incoming raw data needs to be processed upwards on this stack or pyramid so that you create an understanding and that you put people in a position where they can act with insight uh, and really be ready uh, and proactively uh, take action to be ready as well. So it's clear that data needs to be processed up the stack. And it's very clear also that data needs to be exposed, information needs to be exposed, actionable insights need to be exposed to your workforce so that you don't have a workforce that spends most of their day collecting raw data and trying to figure it out. But you have a workforce that's literally on top of things. They understand what they will have to do tomorrow to be ready for next week. Now let's take half a step back and let's start with the uh, buzzwords or the acronym soup. Uh, let's look at the fundamental concepts and how it all fits together. Artificial intelligence is part of data science. Uh, you've known statistics for years and years or decades and decades already. Statistics is all about collecting raw data, grouping, organizing, analyzing that data, and just deriving patterns, structure, trends, um, from that data. A lot of your traditional network monitoring stacks that do some alarm management, filtering, correlation, deduplication, is just applying basic statistics, basic statistical rules to the incoming telemetry data. Artificial intelligence is an adjacent discipline within data science. Artificial intelligence is actually quite a large discipline. Within artificial intelligence, there are a number of very specific categories of algorithms and very specific disciplines that are more or less ready for adoption in the industry. One discipline that's really advanced uh, a lot and has certainly entered uh, IT industry and production environments recently is ready for prime time adoption is machine learning. Machine learning is all about processing incoming data differently than we did in the past when we only had statistical algorithms. Why do we need to do that? Um, should be fairly obvious to the technical uh, people on this call, but nevertheless, maybe let's spend a minute on this. Your multi-experience, multi-domain, hyper-connected, very dynamic uh, infrastructure is of course uh, providing an enormous amount of raw data points. Historically, the only chance you had was just to keep, try and keep up um, and process more and more data using statistical algorithms, but very clearly, uh, that's not going to scale. You'll hit Moore's law, you'll hit the limits of parallelization. And of course, you have to realize as well that this is an n square problem. If you introduce one functionality in the network, most likely there's a multitude of operational uh, aspects and therefore a multitude of telemetry that becomes available from just that one functionality. The solution cannot be to go blind and ignore data, quite the opposite, in fact. The solution must be to collect more context, to collect more uh, environmental and surrounding information. And uh, both, again, Ivan and Gordon alluded to this nicely. Uh, we are already monitoring the network. We're monitoring applications. We have telemetry from the security environment. You have policies from your intent-based um, uh, segmentation stack. We're also monitoring uh, the Wi-Fi spectrum, their sensor capability in the Cisco access points. We already get client device insights from Apple devices, from Samsung Angle, Amsoid devices. Um, you've heard us talk, you've heard Gordon, Gordon talk about Thousand Eyes. We're getting more insights from the application backends uh, in the cloud. So certainly the solution cannot be to ignore facts and hope for the best. The solution must be to process more information, but process it in a different way so that we can still derive relevant insights and actionable insights from that different way of processing all of that incoming telemetry. And that's exactly where machine learning fits. If we compare the technology, the left-hand side, traditional ways of doing things will look very familiar. In a traditional compute environment, um, there's some data input, there's a program that a software engineer lovingly handcrafted. The computer will use that program to analyze the data and produce an output. That's it, simple. Yeah. 
Well, many of you have probably done that when you were a student or are doing this today when you're scripting in an operational environment. In machine learning, the picture just looks slightly differently. On the left-hand side, we now have input data, but we also have output that forms together, they form a training data set. That training data set is then fed into learning algorithms, machine learning algorithms, to create the program that we will use at runtime to interpret future incoming data. Yes, you need output to train uh, that machine learning engine. The output can come from a manual exercise, it can come from an older system, it can come from any source. What's really important is, of course, the quality of that training data. And then in a real life environment, what you'll do is you'll combine both of these. So within Cisco, in engineering, we might continuously run machine learning algorithms based on the Cisco data lake for you. And then when you run network operations using products like DNA Center, vManage or others, um, you would basically apply uh, the result of that machine learning in your production environment. So yes, very often these things are of course combined together. Again, the key to success here is the quality of that training data on the left-hand side. Yes, I know in universities, academia, education, there's a lot of time and passion and energy spent on the different machine learning algorithms. For us out here in reality, application domains in the industry, all that really matters is the training data because that's a common trait of all of the learning algorithms. The learning algorithms can only be as good as your training data. Now let's do a reality check in terms of what can a computer be trained to do? There's a really good rule of thumb here, and there's actually multiple sources for that. Um, there's a really good rule of thumb that basically states that if as a human being, as an expert, you can look at the data for a few seconds and then get an idea what to do, then most likely a machine learning system can be trained to do that as well. May actually sound a little frustrating because if you think of your network operations, most of what your first line operator, what your escalation engineers, what your senior engineers are doing is not just looking at something for a few seconds and then doing it. But if you ask the question a little differently, uh, I think it becomes clear where we're aiming at with machine learning. In our industry, there's an enormous amount of activity that humans could do in just a few seconds but they will never do it because humans never scale to do all of that. How about looking at the security posture of all your client devices a few times an hour? Each and every one of these would probably just be a few seconds of an expert, but you have thousands, ten thousands, or hundred thousands of client devices on your network, and that posture changes very frequently. So there's no way you're going to throw humans at the problem. Likewise, what about the wireless spectrum in your radio, uh, in your Wi-Fi access network? It only takes a few seconds to look at an access point radio and figure out whether it's healthy or not. But there's no way your operators will look at all of your radios on all of your access points in all of your locations all of the time. But it's exactly where machine learning fits really well. So machine learning can do these kind of activities and very nicely augment and complement traditional approaches in your operations environment. Machine learning uses relatively simple pattern matching and learning mechanisms. So there's a word of caution here as well. Um, there's very often, there's no logical reason uh, behind what machine learning is doing. And I'd like to illustrate this with a little example from outside networking industry. Um, as Hugo mentioned, we've moved to Switzerland. So yes, I'm biased. What you see on this screen here, the green curve, represents the uh, per capita consumption of cheese in the US in any given year. And the blue curve on this slide, um, slightly sad curve, uh, represents the people who die from becoming entangled in their bed sheets in any given year in the US. It's quite amazing, in fact, that the US Statistical Service has data on both of those. And what you can clearly see on the chart is that they actually correlate. Now, all of us have probably been eating cheese at some point. Um, all of us have probably been sleeping at some point as well. So we qualify as having a little bit of subject matter expertise and context information. And we can probably all agree that no, there's no logical reason behind this correlation. This is probably just coincidence. 
point I'm trying to get across here is that when you're looking at the results from machine learning, when we represent machine learning actionable insights to your operators, it always has to be done in context. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, the screenshot on the right-hand side is from DNA Center. Um, it's actually a wireless access point client density chart that you see there, where we put this in context uh, across multiple days, multiple weeks. We put it in context against different access points. We can even put it in context against some of your industry peers out there that run similar networks. So your operators will always see those findings in context and they can derive um, and they can understand and derive whether this is meaningful or not. There's no logical reason per se behind what machine learning is doing. However, logical reasoning is actually something that another set of algorithms can do really well. If we add to data science, also cognitive science, if we add a logical model of the problem space to it, then there's a second category of algorithm and machine learning, uh, algorithm and AI approaches um, that leverage machine reasoning on top of machine learning. And yes, those categories can indeed derive logical conclusions from incoming data and a model behind that data. Let me illustrate with a similar type of chart uh, as well. This looks very similar to what we had when we were touching on machine learning only. Yes, we still need an input training data set with input data and output data. Um, in contrast to machine learning, where the data set, the training data set needs to be really, really complete. That's a little bit less of an issue with machine reasoning. In addition to what we need with machine learning, here we also need knowledge. Knowledge is composed of models, rules, logic. And then we can train a machine reasoning engine that can perform some of this evaluation, these evaluations in runtime. Now, if you think about networking industry, if you think about what we're just doing on top of traditional networking with intent-based, policy-based, micro and macro segmentation, our industry is full of models and rules and policies. It's full of layer one, two, three protocols, their behaviors. It's full of topology, layer one, two, three topologies, dependencies. So this is actually a really good space to apply machine reasoning algorithms uh, to a particular problem in, in a networking environment. As with the training data for machine learning, the quality of the knowledge is absolutely key to success here. I've just put the two types of algorithms side by side for reference for you. I'm not going to talk through them uh, in detail here. Um, the simple takeaway here is that they nicely complement each other. Training data is absolutely critical on the left-hand side for machine learning. Quality of knowledge is absolutely critical for machine reasoning on the right-hand side. And I think if you reflect a little bit on where we are as Cisco, you'll understand our passion and enthusiasm around this. We certainly um, build these products, have built these products quite successfully for decades. So we have the engineering knowledge in-house. We have the principal distinguished fellows um, within Cisco. Uh, all of that model is right there at our fingertips. We operate, our customers operate the biggest global install base. We operate networks as Cisco IT ourselves. We have a support organization with the CX and TAC organization. So we have direct access to a lot of support uh, information as well. We have an ecosystem of partners. We have a skilled workforce. We've just done some strategic uh, acquisitions over the last couple of years as well that give us additional insights. So we're actually in an absolutely unique position with the Cisco Data Lake because we have access to some of the best data and some of the best domain knowledge on this planet. This is not something that anyone else could easily replicate. So yes, of course, we're quite excited about that. And then of course, uh, we're making sure that the power of what you see on the right-hand side, whether it's exposed through the Cisco DNA Center or another product, is exactly coming from that data and that knowledge being applied to machine learning and machine reasoning type of algorithms. Well, let's shift focus a little bit and just quickly look at what can AI do for network analytics today, right? Not talking about futures, but talking about what we're actually delivering to you right now. And I'm using Cisco DNA Center here as an example, because that's a very short-term and realistic starting point for you. Within DNA Center, there is, in fact, a machine reasoning engine that we've trained in 
uh, our backend. Uh, that machine reasoning engine is something you can use in DNA Assurance to get insights and actionable advice. And just for, again, another reality check, a screenshot of that, uh, of one use case that you would see in a user interface. This is actually uh, a client onboarding failure. So you might have a VIP user uh, not being able to get on the network. Uh, what you see on top here is a green envelope, a valid behavior uh, of the network for this kind of scenario. You see a number of common traits of other indicators. And at the bottom, you see the culprit, the root cause, and in the user interface, in fact, you have a human readable description of what the issue is, who is impacted, how many users are impacted, what is the root cause, and what is a recommended sequence of actions that your operators can take to resolve it. So that's the type of thing that you can already get today from these kind of algorithms. This is around incident management. Likewise, your architects, your senior engineers, when they're doing planning, forecasting, when they're extrapolating what they need to do next week, next month, there's actually a lot of trending information that we can present in the user interface as well. What you're looking at uh, here is a screenshot from what we call a bee swarm analysis, which is a very powerful user interface to identify outliers and find that one access point, for example, in this particular uh, case here, that was suddenly exposed to a huge amount of noise in the radio spectrum over the last two weeks. And therefore, you probably want to look at what's happening in that particular location. You can also do comparisons not only about technological peers, but against peers in your network, additional sites. We can do comparison against peers in your industry with a similar install base, obviously in an anonymized fashion. So you get an idea of what your outliers, what your deviations are, and you can really add another level of insight and functionality on top of what your DNA center already provides. So yes, Cisco AI Network Analytics is an add-on to Cisco DNA Assurance, uh, which is already uh, available in the product. We're serious about this. You've heard about the investments we've made. We're serious about this in terms of building a scalable global AI platform, some of which you can currently consume in the form of Cisco AI for Network Analytics via DNA uh, Assurance. But of course, as I said before, we're serious about building a scalable platform that can certainly be applicable for a much broader, much wider domain going forward. We're also doing this professionally. Um, we're in Europe over here. Um, things like GDPR, uh, various different country and vertical and industry regulations apply. So yes, of course, uh, we are doing our due diligence for dealing with data privacy and personally identifiable information. A lot of that engineering, in fact, um, just anecdotal uh, evidence here is being done out of Europe. So people understand firsthand what it means to live in this kind of environment. All of the personally identifiable in information that's escalated into the Cisco cloud is actually depersonalized, anonymized, encrypted, and hashed before it's sent to the cloud. There's no way it can be correlated back to a human in the cloud. It's only when the findings are arrived back uh, at your DNA center cluster on premise, there on premise, you can actually correlate it back to your particular environment. Starting to realize benefits, uh, we do have statistics and data points, uh, of course, and I'd like to just quickly illustrate this on a study based on a study that we've done with our first dozen uh, adopters, where there was a factor between six and eight. Um, when you were looking at traditional tools versus Cisco DNA Assurance. And there was another factor of around four on top of it when you added Cisco AI Network Analytics on top of DNA Assurance. So significant, significant noise reduction in your operations team and therefore significant um, efficiency gain as well. But instead of Bruno talking through statistics, why don't we listen to one of our customers that's already deploying this here in Europe? To me, artificial intelligence is the way to handle the workloads of the future. My name is Florian Schröffel. I'm head of the department Basic Infrastructure and Services. Reva International is a food retailer in Central and Eastern Europe. We operate 5,000 stores in 11 countries. Our internal customers expect the network simply to work. We implemented the Cisco DNA Center with assurance, including AI and network analytics. With personalized baselining, assurance learns how our network behaves 
and informs us only about the relevant issues. The time to resolve a ticket has been reduced dramatically because now you have all the information at your fingertips. I'm one of two persons working in the wireless planning and operations team at Rewe International. One cool thing about the Cisco DNS centers are the wireless sensors. We are using them to get a client-independent view of our network, so we can see trends and act accordingly. My favorite view is the client and network health overview. It allows me to look at the single store and how the network is performing there. One typical issue would be that a store manager calls me and tells that yesterday the network was not working. I now search for the client, open his 360 view and zoom into the relevant time, getting the root cause presented. Out of all the available information, Insights shows us only the important data points, which is extremely helpful. This is the biggest improvement for me. With Cisco DNA Center, I'm now able to see all areas of the network at a single point, which was not possible before. The biggest improvement is relevancy. Now, with AI network analytics, we can focus on the important things. My team has more time to focus on new projects and innovations. Cisco is our trusted partner since the mid-90s, and we want to go this way together. Impressive, isn't it, to hear live from one of our customers uh, using this on a daily basis. We have several hundred actually using this uh, capability on a daily basis. One thing I'd like to emphasize as we wrap it up is that I've really only been focusing on enterprise networking access here. Obviously, AI is relevant across a much broader part of the Cisco portfolio. There are a couple of starting points I would recommend uh, for you to follow up. First of all, there's uh, an AI ML white paper for technical decision makers. Uh, we have more uh, documentation and information on DNA assurance as well. And then, of course, for a broader perspective, there's the uh, link at the bottom as a starting point for you. Um, demo capabilities are there. You can still meet one-on-one -on -one, uh, with one of our experts throughout this week. And, of course, across Europe and EMER, we have trained specialists in both partners and within Cisco. So certainly plenty of opportunity to think outside the box and put AI to good use as you're approaching operational challenges out there. With that, Hugo, um, back to you. And uh, thanks, of course, for joining. Thank, thank you, Bruno. Really impressive what the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and machine learning can, uh, can do for us. And seeing it implemented in a customer life scenario is even uh, more impressive. So we have time for a very quick one. You need to promise me that the, the answer is going to be a, a quick one. Uh, a lot of uh, in on knowing whether by moving to AI, ML, ML, MR, do they need to wait until all their operators or part of their operators are well trained on those uh, technologies or they can start right away? That's in fact a very good one, Hugo. Yes, indeed. Uh, the short answer is no, right? This may be advanced algorithms, but we're making very sure that we're exposing these actionable insights to your first line operators the very same way we're exposing findings from on-premise and traditional algorithms. So no, they will not see, be surprised. They don't have to be retrained. They can literally just act uh, on those findings. They will know it's coming from ML because we want the transparency, but they don't have to. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bruno, for uh, this great session.